What happens in Vegas stays in Vegas. Now Vegas down by as many as 14. Energized by the crowd, Cam Vegas. Yes. 20 seconds, Nate. Hurry up, Nate. 16. Get them going, Nate. Let's go. You're now in NHL City. Only won by Vegas, but the shot was blocked by Schwartz, or at least it glanced off him, and then going through the middle of the ice. Tarasenko's got Shin on his right. You're listening to The Mean Gene Show on 101.5 FM, 720 AM, KDWN. And now, here's your host, Mean Gene. Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the Mean Gene Show. Hope you're enjoying your Memorial Day weekend. Before I get started, I have to say I had a great time last week doing the show at the Westgate Las Vegas Resort and Casino. want to thank my guest, Gordon Prouty, Vice President, Community Affairs, Public Relations, for allowing the Mean Gene Show to hang out in the sports book of the Westgate Casino, uh, which is always a great experience, folks. I had a really good time. We have another great show planned for you this evening. We're continuing our coverage of the NBA playoffs, which are in full swing right now. Joining me later in the second half of the show, Jacob Meadows. Jacob is a contributor to the Mean Gene Show. He's been on my podcast a few times and follows the NBA, NFL, and Major League Baseball. So he will be here to talk about the NBA playoffs. Coming up in a few minutes, though, we're going to talk with New York Times bestselling author and NBA sports writer Sam Smith, who covers the Chicago Bulls and author of The Jordan Rules. The Jordan Rules covers everything from Michael Jordan's stormy relationship with his coaches and teammates and power struggles with management, including verbal attacks on general manager Jerry Cross and tantrums against coach Phil Jackson to Jordan's obsession with becoming the leading scorer and his refusal to pass the ball. You do not want to miss that interview. Anyway, Mean Gene Show is brought to you by the Las Vegas Aces, presidential limousine by Captain, and the Westgate Las Vegas Resort and Casino. My next guest is an NBA writer for the Chicago Bulls website, bulls.com. He's the author of multiple articles and books, including the New York Times bestseller, The Jordan Rules. Please welcome to the show, Sam Smith. Thank you. Good to talk to you. Sam, I, I also need to let my listeners know that you received a Lifetime Achievement Award from the Basketball Writers Association and the Kurt Gowdy Media Award from the Nate Smith Basketball Hall of Fame. Yeah, no, I'm very proud of those. And actually, I should I should stop you know writing at this point because I have nothing more to achieve. <laughs> <laughs> well, hey, that, those oh, are no, some... It's, uh... That's very nice of them. I appreciate it. Absolutely. Great, great. It's an absolute honor to have you here on the show. And I, I want to start off by just asking you, what what inspired you to actually write the Jordan Rules? I mean, at the time, you were already a great sports writer. So what, what made you want to write a book? Well, it wasn't to be greater or anything like that. Actually, it was... Uh... It, it was it was just you know sort of anybody's you know in mind to natural curiosity to see if I can do something and I know it's hard for people to believe now but Jordan wasn't held in uh, that tremendous acclaim back then he he was great you know he's popular and he won the MVP and you know had a lot of achievements 63 points in a playoff game so so he was a special player. Mm-hmm. Um, but, you know, the narrative at the time was you, you won by being a team player, making other players better, that cliche. And that was Magic and Bird and, and even Isaiah, you know, to a lesser extent, but not Jordan because he was a scorer. And the notion then was you couldn't win a title uh, if you had the leading scorer on your team. It had only been done like once in the previous 35 years. So he, he so it wasn't like, oh, you know, he, here I've got the guy who's going to be the greatest greatest player of all time let me document what a season is like so it was more yeah I've been traveling with the team several years and and got to know the team and was watching their climb and you know it was exciting and and, uh the other part is you know I had having been with the team we traveled commercial then uh the the teams didn't have their own plane they traveled regular commercial like everybody else Mm -hmm. Uh, we stayed in modest hotels and stay in riches and four seasons like they do today. There was no massage. There was no, <laughs> there was no, you know, entourage on the, on the, there was cooks and one cooks and oh, there was nothing. It was just, you know, the team, a couple of reporters, a few coaches, and that's it. And we made a, like we said, we're on commercial flights and all. So 
I, I had been, I, and I love daily journalism. I worked for the Chicago Tribune. That's what I was covering the Bulls for at the time. And I, I worked for the Chicago Tribune for 30 years. And and I still love, you know, sort of daily journalism. That's why I, uh, uh, I worked for the Bulls website kind of as a, as a contributor. So it's, you know, it's been great. I've been able to keep my hand in sort of daily journalism. So, but I haven't traveled around and, you know, been around. And I always thought, well, books, you know, that's something different or special. And then I've met a lot of people who've written books. And I thought, well, they're not so smart. You know, I, <laughs> I can do that. You know, if they can do that, I ought to be able to do that. So I thought I'd, I'd always uh, fancied a book that uh, David Halberstam, one of my favorite authors, worked for the New York Times and wrote great books on uh, the media and Vietnam War. Mm -hmm. And he had written this uh, uh, kind of embedded diary of the Portland Trailblazers in the late 70s. And I, and I really always enjoyed that book as sort of behind the scenes, like what it's really like. like you know, fans always now, you know, you know, they, you know, they put a microphone with a player, but they, you know, they excise all the interesting stuff. And, um, you know, so I thought that that's what fans are really interested, you know, peeling back the curtain, what's what's mm -hmm. really going on basketball wise, at least. And so I thought, you know, that I would just do a diary of a season. And, you know, we, the Bulls weren't thinking about being a title, you know, going on a on a that's the other thing on a championship run i was very lucky as far as the book in the sense that right time right place um they had been, uh, been as, as everybody saw who watched the last dance they mm -hmm. you know they were couldn't get by the pistons didn't think they could mm -hmm. and so going into that season there was still large question about getting by the pistons they weren't favored in the east and, and or anything like that and and even they uh, didn't believe at the time they could they could win in Detroit and get by the Pistons, or at least it was uncertain. Mm -hmm. So I did, there was no notion at the time that you know here here's this uh, jewel laying empty in the desert, and I'm just going to pick it up and be rich. <laughs> I was like, yeah, hey, just write a book. I'll, I'll I'll show myself I could do it, and I'll have it on my you know uh, shelf for uh, 20 years, and mm -hmm. I can look back and say I wrote a book. And so. It all took me by surprise as much as anybody. Wow, absolutely. And and in your book, The Jordan Rules, was published in 1992. ESPN's Last Dance was released in 2020, some 28 years later. And, and in your opinion, Sam, how accurate was the Michael Jordan uh, characterization? I, I thought the documentary uh, was terrific. Obviously, you know, the timing is such with the virus and everybody's inside and um, – you know, it was sort of, you know, original programming at the time, you know, was sort of great and then kind of a step back, you know, waiting from week to week. You couldn't stream it and watch all the episodes, you know, in 10, you know, one day or something. Um, I kind of joke sometimes, uh, people ask me about it. I said, it's like a lot of those TV movies that you watch or some of the Law and Order episodes. <laughs> you know, it's, it's it's based on a true story. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. You know, it, it, it was basically accurate, but they, there were just some elements of it, like the pizza thing, you know, the po a, a poison pizza that wasn't, that didn't happen, you know, that didn't happen. And his pizza wasn't poisoned. <laughs> but, the, but, the, but the, you know, but, uh, you know, it's funny, you know, to, you know, to speculate or whatever, and, and, and that's fine. And also, you know, memories over 30 years later are not the same. And, you know, people can accuse me of that as well. But one thing I do know, and, you know, I understand for dramatic purposes, they had to emphasize it. But the Bulls did not break up that team in 98. And Jordan broke up that team. Mm. And, and he, he did not want to play. He made it clear. And, and it, what, what one element they really did leave out um, was that, that it, 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 that was the uh, 98 99 was the lockout year mm -hmm. when they didn't start playing until February, mm -hmm. and in late now it was November or December. Jordan really sliced open his finger on his right hand with a cigar cutter mm -hmm. and had surgery, so he couldn't have played that year because mm -hmm. he had surgery on his hand. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so you know he could they conveniently for sort of forgot that, and I understand it's more dramatic to say right. you know yeah. We could have kept this going. They should have given us a chance. So that that that, that was a little bothersome to me. Probably was more bothersome to the Bulls. <laughs> but you know, but, but basically, yeah, it was a great. It it, it, it did the what, what took me by surprise. You know, when I first heard about what they were doing, they said last dance and all, and you know, Phil Jackson, had, as they point showed that he he mentioned that season because he knew the Bulls 
you know, he was gone and all. And, and he recognized, too, that it was probably the end of the run. So he called it the last day. He always had these motivational themes for a season. And, and he had them all, all season. It wasn't just the last season. Mm -hmm. You know, but that was his theme for that, um, you know, uh, for that last season that, that you know, that, that he, he recognized that, you know, the run was, the run was coming to an end. Right. And so, um, I forgot, I forgot my, I always do that too. You know, being, being, being a, being a senior citizen now, I forgot my, I forgot my, 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 my digressions as well. Um, but yeah, go ahead and ask you another question. Well, hey, uh, once again, folks, we, we are talking to the New York Times bestselling author, and NBA writer for the Chicago Bulls, Sam Smith, here on the Mean Gene Show, KDWN, 720 AM, 101.5 FM. If you don't mind, I want to kind of fast forward to the to the current Bulls. And uh, they, they finished the season 31-41, 11th overall in the NBA Eastern Conference, just two games back of the Charlotte Hornets and, and that uh, potential play-in game. But they dropped five of the last ten. So how do you think they would have done in, in, in these playoffs? Uh, I, I was disappointed for them because I think they, at least in the in the play-in, they they would have done really well. And they, it, it, you know, it's easy to say when you don't get in. Mm -hmm. And you know, and they had a big disruption during the season by making the trade for Vucevic. Mm -hmm. um, you know, a couple of first-round uh, futures, and of course, everybody, you know, suffered this. But you know, Levine went out at the end, missed the like eleven of the last fifteen games with COVID, and but everybody says that you know Washington was overwhelmed with it but but of the four teams uh, that made the uh, play in they were nine and three uh, against those four teams and they were five and oh since the all-star break against mm -hmm. those four teams so so they had great success but, but it's their fault they missed it it, it was a, it was a disappointing ending to me for them because especially getting Vucevic and having Zach Levine, you know, who had a, his career season and, uh, you know, has clearly become an all-star level mm -hmm. uh, player. Uh, Vucevic had been, you know, two-time all-star, you know, and to have those two players and, and not, you know, not being able to get a crack at it, um, I thought was, you know, in a moment really disappointing. I mm -hmm. think new management is, uh, and, and new coach, you know, Billy Donovan was the first year coach mm -hmm. and, Arturis from Denver is a first year executive. So they, they were basically saying, and I understand that, that, you know, this move, the moves we made were for the future is more for next right. year, year after we're adding this summer. So I, I understand that, but from somebody who goes to all the games and writes about it in season, I was kind of hoping that they would get a crack at it. And, um, uh, cause I, I actually thought they had a good chance. Now they, I wouldn't put them up against Milwaukee or mm -hmm. Brooklyn, certainly, you know, I think's a favorite of uh, Philadelphia, any of those teams at this point. But, you know, that bottom rung of teams, uh, I really would have liked to see them take a shot at it. So I was kind of disappointed not to see uh, that opportunity. And, and actually, you know, by this time, I finally would have gotten into an arena to <laughs> do all season. I know, I, I know it. And, and and looking into next season, though, and, and with this current Bulls roster, and do you think they will improve to make the playoffs, or should they acquire additional assets to, to compete in what has now become a much improved Eastern Conference? Well, I, I say yes. Of course, I said that last year, too, and <laughs> they didn't, you know, so I, I thought for sure they would be at least in, you know, eight, nine, ten, mm -hmm. seven, eight, nine, ten, which they were you know, really until Levine went out for that last stretch. And so, um, yeah, they, you know, they potentially have, uh, you know, a substantial amount of cap room where, you know, they can uh, remove several players. They have unguaranteed contracts, free agents, and uh, they probably need to, you know, it's not a great summer, of course, unless the Clippers get swept or something. And Kawhi decides he wants to live in the Midwest, <laughs> which I highly doubt. Um, you know, and, 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 and playoffs does change it. You know, when a team gets out, you know, early, like, you know, maybe cause it could happen with the Clippers. Uh, maybe Paul George, you know, becomes available, stuff like that. So you don't know. But still, you know, they, they probably most need a facilitating tech point guard, you know, and maybe – you know, could do this free agents, not, you know, the highest level, but, you know, Mike Connolly, Kyle Lowry, you know, players like that, uh, Lonzo Ball, the restricted, and, and, it, it, and they potentially could have, you know, 25 million or so room, you know, to add with Levine and, um, 
and Vucevic, and, and uh, they got a, a, a rookie who looks like he could be pretty good, Patrick Williams. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and so, you know, they're, they have the possibilities of a pretty decent core, but, you know, we're still talking possibilities for a team that uh, finished 11th. So mm-hmm. it's still it's still down there. Like, like I said, we, we, you know, watch them more often than others. We think, it, you know, that they have possibilities and they are better, but, you know, the, the old – Bill Parcells, you are what your record is. Their right. record is 31 and 41, and they finished like 11th place and finished behind a couple of teams like Charlotte, which didn't look very good at all in that play in. Mm-hmm. Well, Sam, I, I, I want to close with this question because I saw your playoff predictions on, on the Bulls' website, and I know in the West you like the Trailblazers over the, the Denver Nuggets, and that series seemed like it might go seven games, but do you still like the Trailblazers to, to, to win that series? I usually like the team that wins each game. So I like the Trailblazers after one, and I like Denver after two. <laughs> but, <laughs> but you're right. I mean, when it's a seven-game series, if it comes to that, um, you, you know, it's it really becomes a pick You know, it's a lucky shot, a bounce, whatever kind of thing like that. You know, I went with Portland kind of, you know, because of the absence of Jamal Murray. Mm-hmm. You know, if Jamal Murray would play, and I would have picked Denver to win the West, mm-hmm. you know, to, to come out of the West. Um you know, but now with, you know, Michael Porter and, you know, that's good. Aaron Gordon was a, you know, was a great pickup when they had Murray, mm-hmm. you know, but now those two guys having to be this, you know, support players, mm-hmm. I, I don't, you know, it's hard to see. I, I'll still stick with Portland because I think, you know, with the two scoring guards and, and the big guys they've got, I, I still think they have enough. But, you know, again, any of these series that if you, if we look at them and say, yeah, that could be a seven game series, that means it's coming down to a bounce or somebody. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, Paul, you know, Chris Paul, all of a sudden shoulder, you know, they're looking pretty right. good, maybe, and, you know, and then Paul goes out and things change. So, you know, and especially, you know, the one thing we don't talk about much because the NBA, you know, been good and, you know, the, the virus is, is fading. But if, you know, if somebody, you know, does something or something happens, all of a sudden you lose like the Bulls did at the end of the season, all of a sudden for three weeks, they lose Zach Levine, who was basically mostly staying home. Mm-hmm. You know, I, I don't know how it is, you know, what happened, but something happened. So, you know, there's still that thing hanging over the league too. So, but, but on the other hand, for the fans, I think it makes it makes it the most interesting playoffs in many years because other than maybe Brooklyn, you know, which which has some flaws, I, I think you look around the whole league and you can't, you know, we could always say, oh, Golden State's going to win. Well, of course, we back the Bulls or Spurs. You know, there's really no team to look at now and say, oh, yeah. You know, you know, how are you going to beat them? Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, how are you going to take four? You know, you can see LeBron is not back yet from his, you know, ankle. You know, maybe in two weeks, maybe as it goes on. But with all the play, that's going to be tough. So, you know, there's really, there's really not nearly a dominant team as they've been in previous years. And so I think that makes it really more interesting for everybody. Absolutely, Sam. And i tell you what. I can talk to you all day. I, 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 I certainly appreciate your time. I want to thank you for coming on the Mean Gene Show, and I really enjoyed the conversation. Yeah, good to talk to you. Take care. All right, folks. Sam Smith, New York Times bestselling author, NBA writer for the Chicago Bulls here on the Mean Gene Show. Great stuff from Sam Smith, the bestselling author of The Jordan Rules on the Mean Gene Show. Uh, I tell you what, it's not every day that you get a chance to talk to a best-selling author and an NBA sports reporter of his caliber. I mean, this man knows his basketball, as you could very well hear. And uh, I, I just thought it was very interesting on The Last Dance, which was released 28 years after he released The Jordan Rules. And, of course, now... The Last Dance was about the Chicago Bulls in, in, in the fall of uh, 1997. Michael Jordan and the Chicago Bulls, they allowed a film crew to to follow them as they um, went for their sixth NBA uh, championship. And, and then, of course, now that entire series sort of portrayed not only Michael Jordan, but uh, uh, most of the Bulls, his teammates, and uh, interesting enough, the Detroit Pistons, who was that team that they could not beat for some reason, whatever it was, they they just couldn't get past the Pistons, but they eventually did, of course, and went on to win those those six uh, NBA championships. But the Jordan Rules, which 
mainly talked about uh, Michael Jordan's relationship with his teammates, with his coaches, and uh, very, very interesting. So now I would advise you to to, to find the book. It, it's uh, a best-selling book uh, written by Sam Smith and and. And in addition to that, it also talked about the tantrums that he had against Coach Phil Jackson and his obsession with, you know, just becoming the, the lead scorer. So a little bit more in detail than The Last Dance, which, you know, sometimes reading things is better than seeing them on TV because as Sam said himself, you know, sometimes TV, you know, it just it has to be dramatic and it has to have like that, you know, fairy tale ending and all of that. So I was very glad that he was able to to pinpoint that and put it into perspective. And, and, and I mean, cause he went all in with uh, the, the verbal attacks on, on Jerry Krause, the general manager, the late Jerry Krause, the general manager. And of course there, there were stories about Michael Jordan throwing uh, extremely difficult passes to Bill Cartwright, you know, just because he was just frustrated and, and just so obsessed with winning and, and getting it right. And of course, uh, Will Purdue. We all heard the story about he he threw a basketball and hit Will Purdue upside the head. Uh, so, in this book, which I have read excerpts from this book, which are very interesting, but I will definitely read this book because I owe it to Sam Smith. And it just sounds like it's really, really good stuff. Okay, really, really good basketball drama. Uh, and and you know it has to be for it to be a best selling um, book by by Sam Smith. So anyway. Uh, we also got a chance to talk about the current Bulls and, you know, because I was really looking at that and, and Sam was right. I mean, the, down the stretch, the Bulls were able to be the team like the Boston Celtics. They handled them pretty convincingly, uh, through, you know, over the season. And they actually beat a couple of teams that are currently in this NBA playoffs. So uh, I would have to think that, wow, you know, had they got to the position, the 10th spot in order to, to play in, they – you know, probably would have still been eliminated, but just the fact that it would have been somewhat of an accomplishment, especially after what happened to the Bulls, getting rid of their former coach, bringing in Billy Donovan and and um, and his coaching staff, which, um, you know, had to work with what they had to work with and then being able to pull out the, the big trade to get Vucevic and, and those guys. So I would have to think that that Bulls team in the future is going to, to look pretty good. I mean, they really, really do have. And Maurice Cheeks, uh, who is, uh, and it's just interesting how Maurice Cheeks has stayed there in Oklahoma City when uh, Scotty Brooks got fired, and then Billy Donovan takes over in Oklahoma City, and things don't work out there. But the relationship that Billy Donovan and Maurice Cheeks was able to build to now carry on to this new Chicago Bulls. Uh, franchise is, is is interesting, and they really do have some some great pieces to work with. Uh, Patrick Williams, uh, as as he mentioned there, uh, 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 getting in uh, well, Kobe White, which is a, a a great player as well, and 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 uh, Vucevic, who we had already mentioned, and they picked up Daniel Tyson in a trade with the Boston Celtics. But I would have to say, uh, and 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 Markin and one of one of their other players, I would have to say that this team overall. Uh, is is going to get better now? I did mention that the Eastern Conference just seems to be getting more and more uh, crowded there as far as the competition level, but I still think there's room for the Chicago Bulls. I think there's an opportunity there for that team to to uh, to to exceed. So we will see. But uh, I had to give him a hard time about his playoff predictions because I, I did see that he had pretty much picked out. Uh, he didn't pick a winner. He just picked the first round series, and you can go to uh, chicagobulls.com or uh, the Chicago Bulls website, and you can just look, see Sam Smith's um, postings and articles there that he does on a daily basis. But he, he, uh, I particularly looked at that Portland Trailblazers, Denver Nuggets series and wanted to question him about it. You know, so that series is looking like it's going to go seven, and it's, it's going to be interesting, but I do agree with him. You know, um, you bring in, you know, Aaron Gordon, and then it looks like okay, things are going to be, you know, uh, to their advantage there, especially with Jamal Murray. You know, having both of those guys, but now that Murray is out, and you know, they they had to get in someone there that was going to keep the keep things afloat. Uh, even though the Joker, who we all know is going to be the NBA um, MVP, 
And uh, but that team is still alive. So, you know, Coach Malone has that team playing and it's going to be interesting to see how things work out. So, all right. Exciting first half to the Mean Gene Show. You have to stick around because we are going to get even deeper into the NBA playoffs in the second half. Uh, the Mean Gene Show contributor Jacob Meadows is going to join us and we are going to jump all into the NBA playoffs where things stand, where we think it might go as far as these teams in the first round. Who's going to advance to the second round? There still is a lot of basketball left to be played. So stick around. You are listening to the Mean Gene Show right here on KDWN, 720 AM, 101.5 FM, Las Vegas. Once again, you're listening to the Mean Gene Show on 101.5 FM, 720 AM, KDWN. Once again, you're listening to the Mean Gene Show here on KDWN 720 AM 101.5 FM. Hey, if, if you've had a chance to catch up on some of my podcasts, especially during the NFL playoffs, then you are familiar with my next guest. I, you know, I've never met anyone that researches and does his homework like this guy do. I mean, it's one of the main reasons he's a contributor to the Mean Gene Show. And he's calling in from Houston, Texas. Please welcome to the show, Jacob Meadows. What's up, Jacob? What is up, Mr. Gene? How are you today, brother? Hey, man, I'm I'm doing great, and I'm ready to get into these playoffs because it's an exciting time for NBA fans. And if you don't mind, let's look at the Eastern Conference, and I'm going to get your thoughts on what's the likely outcome, who survives and moves on to the next round. What do you say about that, Jacob? Uh, well, the East <laughs> – so the East is uh, an interesting animal because there's definitely one team that sticks out above the rest in the East right now. And they kind of, they built a super team there in the off season. Everybody kind of had their qualms about it. But in, in terms of the East, I think the Nets might really have that shored up, man. They look amazing against Boston. And I, I know that, you know, Boston doesn't necessarily have the most, you know, primo talent, but there are no slumps by any cho- by any chance. The Celtics are good. They're not a bad team. And the, the Nets are just absolutely handing it to them, man. They are. They are, Jacob. They, they are. And I just got off uh, the phone earlier in the show with Sam Smith. He's a uh, sports writer, a uh, uh, New York Times bestselling author who wrote the book, The Jordan Rules. And, and we talked about the current Bulls team who who was right there in that 11th seed, you know, and they had handled the Celtics pretty good. And Sam said, hey, man, I, I, I like the Bulls better than the Celtics, you know, uh, for that play-in tournament. But, I mean, it's showing, Jacob, just like you say. You know, you got a two seed and a seven seed. You know, I mean, granted, I think Brown is hurt, right, for the for the Boston Celtics. So they really don't have a full team, right? Exactly. Yes, sir. Yeah, not, I really do. Th- I mean, that's definitely not helping the cause, but I mean, man, the Nets are just so good this postseason <laughs> on both ends of the on the court, man. Yeah, they are. And it seems like, you know, just like in the West with the Lakers, you know, when you get all your horses there you know, on the track and they're ready to run, you know, and, and that's what's happening with the Brooklyn Nets there. So like you say, you know, they, they got a, a, a good lead on that series. Uh, I want to talk about the 3-6 matchup, and that's the Milwaukee Bucks and the Miami Heat because that particular series was uh, important because last year we all know what Milwaukee, I mean what Miami did to the Milwaukee Bucks. So Milwaukee is saying, nah, this is a different year, different team, and all of that stuff. What do you think about that series? Oh, yeah, man. So COVID really gave Milwaukee the juice, man. They came out. They absolutely were not going to get bounced by the Heat again. And I, so I like the Heat. I'm a Heat fan, more or less. Uh, I like the Heat coming into the series, and Milwaukee is just absolutely handling. It's just as bad as the Nets. It is literally just as bad as the Nets and Celtics. The Mil- Milwaukee Bucks are just absolutely giving it to the Heat right now. And there's nothing they can do. I mean, even their star, Jimmy Buckets, man, he has been – it almost seems like he's off his game, and he's the only player on that team that's actually capable of keeping up with the competition. And it is – they are, they, are, they look like they're about to get thumped in the first round. Yeah, it, 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 and unfortunately, I mean, you know, I mean, hey, come on. You, you, when you're looking at the Miami Heat and you look at the Lakers, those were the teams that went far in the bubble, played in the NBA championship. So they didn't really get a lot of rest for the 72-game season – so they have, I mean, if anyone wants to complain, you know, uh, those two teams have all the rights to. But, 
I mean, you got to know Milwaukee was waiting on this. Milwaukee kind of went and reloaded a little bit, got some extra pieces there in Milwaukee to take on anybody. Uh, not only Miami, they were looking at Philly and looking at – they saw what the Nets were trying to do there. So they went and got got some pieces there, and it, it looked like it's working out pretty good for them, Jacob. Oh, yeah. It, it's a revenge tour, man. I mean, it, but before the playoffs even started, I mean, everybody should have been able to guess – that this was going to end up happening because it is it is a revenge tour through and through it's like during the nfl seasons back when uh tom brady was getting knocked out by eli manning <laughs> it was kind of like that following year when the pats would play him again and they would absolutely just pummel him and it's it's one of those where it, they have a chip on their shoulder they have enough talent for it to not really matter and they came out and they are just absolutely slapping them around they are they are and and you know i mean still you know a lot more games left to be played even with the brooklyn boston series and the milwaukee miami series but uh, you know east coast basketball at one time it just wasn't that appealing and interesting but this year you know i i would have to agree with all eight teams that represent the eastern conference what about you oh 100 even in the west i i think that and to be completely candid with you, I think that this is one of the best playoff series is the wrong word for it, but, I, but one of the best first rounds of the NBA playoffs yeah, yeah. that I've got to see my entire life. Uh, the matchups are terrific. The power is great. The teams are balanced more or less. Like it is, it is a good year for the playoffs. It is, and I do agree with you on that because, and I've heard a lot of people say that, including the TNT crew, Barkley and and and. Uh, Kenny Smith and and Ernie and Shaq, I, they everyone is saying that all across the the sports world. So, let's talk about this series because this is the series that I like, and I have of late had quite a few East Coast sports writers on this show, and and uh, particularly uh, we had uh, Brian um, Mahoney on, and he talked about the New York Knicks and how exciting it was. I mean, he actually covers the Knicks and the uh, and the Brooklyn Nets, but. To have the Knicks in the playoffs and the Lakers in the playoffs, man, you know the network's got to be going crazy. Oh, uh, yep, yep. This was my most most important matchup to talk about today with Eugene because the Knicks, the Knicks are contenders, Gene. The Knicks, <laughs> the Knicks have systematically sucked most of my life. The Knicks are contenders. I talked about COVID giving Milwaukee the juice, but D Rose and the Knicks are absolute contenders. The the Hawks, their starters cannot outscore their bench. They do not look good on the front. And man, I, I am telling you, what a year for the New York Knicks, brother. This is the best matchup in the first round, in my opinion. It's going to go the full length of it, and I do think the Knicks end up moving forward. Wow. I, and, you know, I, I mean, it's just crazy because if they do, they're going to be possibly p- uh, playing the Philadelphia 76ers. Well, I could just say they're going to be playing the 76ers if they move on. But back yeah. to the series, though, the 4-5 matchup is always good in the NBA playoffs anyway. But who would have thought that these two teams would be high enough in the rankings to get the 4-5 and five matchup? I meant the, the Atlanta Hawks. You know, great coach in there, Trey Young. I mean, this kid, you know, sometimes tried to do it all by himself. He's got to realize he's got a supporting cast, but still, I mean, he's capable of carrying the team on his own, Jacob. Oh, yeah. Well, so that's the thing, though, is he he has to carry the team. He He's their only dis, he's their only perimeter scorer that's consistent whatsoever. I mean, they, he has some help in the paint, but, man, it feels like he's out there. He has to get all the rebounds. He has to score all the points. Like, Trey Young is having to do it all, and I think that's going to end up it, that's going to end up being what puts the Knicks on top of them. I think the Knicks have – they mesh better as a team overall, and I think that's going to end up causing the Hawks to collapse here at the end of this series. Yeah, I agree with you on that. And, and looking at the New York Knicks, I'm, I'm just going to say this. You know, I have been a Tom Thibodeau fan for a long time. I mean, when he was with the Bulls, when he was with the Minnesota Timberwolves, that didn't work out right. But, you know, uh, we, we talked about him early on in a couple of shows ago with uh, one of the sports writers and the fact that bringing in a Derrick Rose and a, and a Todd Gibson, people that he trusts, and, and and that leadership, too, because, uh, I mean, the, the Knicks is a fairly young team. I mean, you, you got a Todd Gibson and a Derrick Rose to reel in, you know, players like like uh, Bullock and, and, um, and, and Randall. Yes, sir. Yeah, absolutely, man. Like, you, and it, it's 
great that you brought up Taj Gibson because what a signing. He has been an absolute just monolith for them. It has been terrific getting to watch him play for the Knicks and really flesh out how but the offense and the defense on that team can really work with the right players in place. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's just amazing. I mean, just one of the most underrated coaches there. Uh, his philosophy hasn't changed. It will not change, you know, and, and it's sort of like some of the great coaches in the NBA, you know, whether it's Pat Riley, Phil Jackson, those coaches that were known for their style, and you have to fit into that style. Tom Thibodeau is one of those coaches, man. If you don't, If you can't play for him, then you're not going to be on any of his teams. and But what he's doing for the city of New York has to be amazing. And, Jacob, this was the most incredible thing about that series. The NBA is probably – I know the NFL had announced they would have full fans in stadiums. I think the NBA got the jump on that. We're seeing over there in the East, we also saw with the Utah Jazz fans there in the West, I mean, we are seeing packed – arenas which is almost you know i'm having to look twice at my tv thinking is this an old game or what because that stadium madison square garden was packed sold out man madison (laughs) square garden was sold out what a time to be alive welcome back to contention the new york knicks what's even more crazy is that the east coast which new york in particularly the covid cases this time last year this was unthinkable to, to have anyone even out in public greeting or meeting each other, but to see how they have just kind of turned. Now, uh, have, have you ever been to the Madison Square Garden, Jacob? I have not. It you, is at the top of my bucket. You have to go, man, because now, and, and, and here's the crazy thing. I've been there, but I've never seen the Knicks play there. I've actually, I saw some college basketball there, but still, you know, you're in the madhouse, as they call it, and it's just like they call it the basketball mecca. But anytime you got the Knicks, and, and no matter how good the Nets are, if the Knicks are just decent, it's it's a win for the city of New York. And and man, Madison Square Garden, it's just nice to see it uh, packed to 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 the hilt again. Oh yeah, and and to that to that effect, you know, it, the Brooklyn Nets are not the team of New York. The city, the <laughs> New York. They are represented by the Knicks. Brooklyn could go on to win the next three championships, and I still think that Madison Square Gardens would sell out before any of the Brooklyn games. As sad of a fact as that is, the Knicks are New York. Sort of like the Clippers in L.A., even though they, they share the same arena, and, and and it doesn't really matter. You try to get Clipper playoff tickets, you're looking at about $65, $70. You try to get Laker playoff tickets, how about uh, six, seven hundred dollars? <laughs> yep, that makes it the exact same thing. The Knicks are New York's team, and it it is just it, it's a it's it's beautiful to see them. Matter. It is. It, it really is. It really is, and, uh, and it matters for like I said, it, the 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 uh, the ratings, the TV. You know, to have both big cities representing in the NBA playoffs has got to be good. All right, let's talk about this last series, and that's the number one seed. Philadelphia 76ers and the Washington Wizards. And, you know, rightfully so, the Wizards deserve to be there. And I saw this coming in that play-in tournament because they were down in at the number 10 spot. And, you know, at the time, Bradley Bill and Russell Westbrook was playing fabulous basketball. And it is no surprise that they are representing in the uh, um, in, in this playoffs. But it, it is also no surprise that they're getting thumped by the Philadelphia 76ers. Yeah, it it seems like the Wizards, it's like their bench is outmatched. That's what it really looks like. I mean, Russ is amazing. I love Bradley Beal. I like the Wizards in general. But it it just seems that they're outmatched on both ends of the court. The 76ers just really seem to have their number, which, I mean, I I can't really complain because the 76ers are good. The 76ers have talent. The 76ers have been contenders for the last couple of years. They are good. They have all the power. They they should be a higher seed. Well, they're the one seed, but they shouldn't be uh, the underdogs in any games. They'll end up being the underdog at some point. But they they really do have enough star power to to move through anybody that they need to. Uh, So, unfortunately for Washington, they really just can't keep up. But like you said, they do deserve to be there, and they look great. And I think that if they retool a little bit in the offseason, I do think that Washington will be right back next year. Yeah, I agree. I agree. And and, and they got to keep Bradley Bill and and, and Russell Westbrook healthy, even though it seems like, you know, having them both on the court, they both have to be on the court in order for – 
the Wizards to be successful long term. So we, we, we're we going to see how that turns out. But, Jacob, I tell you what, man, that that is the East. And I, I, so we're potentially looking at a Philadelphia – New York Knicks matchup, which uh, would be in the conference semifinals. Is that what you're seeing? That is exactly – that's what I'm hoping for, Mm -hmm. Gene. That is what I'm hoping for through and through because I think the Knicks have a chance at beating the 76ers. I think they'd drop the first two games. They'd go down 0-2, and I think they would make it interesting moving forward. They might not be able to take it all, but I do think the Knicks give the 76ers – Every inch of what they can handle. I, I agree. And then and looking at the bottom half of this bracket here, you know, we're, we're on course for a Brooklyn-Milwaukee matchup. I guarantee you this is going to be huge uh, on the, out there on the East Coast, man. And uh, who do you like in this this uh, second-round matchup that's going to be happening? Brooklyn. I cannot, I cannot confidently pick any team over Brooklyn. I really can't. <laughs> they have the biggest three in basketball they do. right now. You can – you can make whatever argument you want for AD and Braun and whoever else and the 76ers lineup. You can, you can make whatever argument you want for them. But Brooklyn has the three biggest stars on the same team. Like, they yeah. have the most star power out of any team. Brooklyn is good. You're they right. are really effing good. <laughs> yeah, you, are, you are so right about that. Well, I'll tell you what, Jacob, man. We are going to circle back here with you and get your thoughts on the next round here, man. But it's always good to have you on. Keep doing your homework, man. You do a great job when you come on the Mean Gene Show. And it's always good to have you. Absolutely, Mr. Gene. I really appreciate it. And I look forward to seeing you the next time, brother. All right. Jacob Meadows, contributor to the Mean Gene Show here on KDWN 720 AM, 101.5 FM. Always a pleasure to have Jacob Meadows on the show. I've never met someone with so much energy, loves to talk about sports, loves to do the research, and knows his business there. We just got through covering the Eastern Conference NBA playoffs, where they are right now and where things might go. And I definitely agree. I mean, the Brooklyn Nets are a team to, 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 to reckon with. But there's still too much basketball left to be played in the NBA playoffs. But we, I, I don't know. Before I can match anyone up with the Philadelphia 76ers, which I think would definitely represent the conference in the Eastern Conference Finals, I, I, I don't know. It's this next series between the Brooklyn Nets and the Milwaukee Bucks that's going to just really tell us a lot because all, uh, Milwaukee is on a mission. And we talk about revenge tour. Milwaukee definitely wants to get there. Doc Rivers' first year in Philly, great things are happening, and Bede is playing great basketball. So stay tuned for the Eastern Conference. We will continue to follow that and see what's going on. Now over to the Western Conference playoffs. So we can start with the Utah Jazz and the Memphis Grizzlies. That 1-8 matchup is so important. And now, I, you know, people are really saying, hmm, maybe the play-in tournament is not so bad because – I mean, when you look at these teams that are, that came in hot, especially the ones that got the, the final eighth spots over the, the Wizards, I told you weeks ago that we want to see the Wizards in the playoffs. Now, I know that they're not going to win that series, but still, you have Bradley Bill, you have Russell Westbrook. It just makes for more exciting basketball. That's what you got over there at the East. Now, over in the Western Conference, I don't really think it mattered whether if it was the Memphis Grizzlies or Steph Curry and the Golden State Warriors. You, whoever was going to be number eight was going to be great. But I tell you what, the Memphis Grizzlies, you know, for a team that just doesn't really have that star power uh, outside of Morant. But, I mean, when you look at this team, they hustle. They play great basketball. Now, I don't think in a seven-game series they are going to beat the Utah Jazz. The Jazz has worked too damn hard this season to fall to a number eight seed. But, I mean, this is just not your typical eighth seed when you look at the Memphis Grizzlies. But I don't think you have to worry about anything. You're going to see the Utah Jazz advance to the conference semifinals. The next uh, the next matchup, the 4-5 matchup in the Western Conference is just as exciting as the one over there in the Eastern Conference. But the Clippers, I don't know what we can say about the Clippers that haven't already been said. I mean, they just – do not get up for big games. Now, they spent a lot of time avoiding the Lakers. Didn't want to play the Lakers in the first round. Well, we obviously know why. But the Western Conference is loaded with great teams. The Dallas Mavericks, the five seed, you know, the, for, for what they did in L.A. is, is I mean, it's just incredible. To go to the Staples Center and beat the Clippers two games and take a lead on the series is, is, is incredible. 
And I think the Clippers are in trouble. And, and you got to think about the amount of money that that owner puts into this team and the results that he's he, he's wanting. So I, I actually thought he pulled the trigger too soon on Doc Rivers. Perhaps should have kept Doc Rivers. Not saying that Tyron Lue is not a great coach, but I, I, I don't know if he – I mean, he has a young coaching staff. He has Chauncey Billups over there uh, assisting him and getting getting this uh, team ready uh, to, to, to go deeper in the playoffs. But, man, they have an uphill battle. And let's just say, you know, they force the seven games and win seven games, which I think the Clippers will still win this series. I know I might be the only one that uh, is thinking that way. But the team is just too damn talented not to. And I got to know that uh, Steve Ballmer, the owner, will have a lot of say-so in this series as, as as it continues to move forward. But, you know, one of the reasons why I think the Clippers are just so discombobulated in the sense because I just, uh, you know, think Paul George and, and Kawhi Leonard play the same position. I just don't know how they complement each other on the basketball court. And, I mean, the Clippers, the, the roster is loaded. I still don't think they have quality big men. Not saying that Zubak is not good, but I just don't think they have – quality big man and and for a team that is really known for defense Patrick Beverly and and and, and those guys and Reggie Jackson you know they are struggling to stop Luka and when the Mavericks are shooting the ball the way that they are shooting the ball I mean it's going to be hard to stop them now I I think the Clippers get a win maybe two don't be surprised if they win two games in LA I mean in Dallas and then this series is all tied up at two apiece, and then you you got the best of three, which is kind of where I think this series is going to go. But the Mavericks are playing great ball. They are also coached uh, very well by Rick Carlisle, so they they know something. And, and Luca, this is the future of the NBA, folks. This guy goes out there and gives his all every night. The other series, the three six matchup, the Denver. Nuggets and the Portland Trailblazers, and we've talked about this. I know Jacob wanted to get into it. We talked about it in the first half of the show with Sam Smith, and he uh, thinks that the Portland Trailblazers will win this series, and, and mainly and that is because they, uh, the Denver Nuggets just don't have that leadership. And Jamal Murray on the floor, even though the Joker, the best player in the NBA, should win the MVP, that team also, like the Clippers, you know, they were underrated last year. They exceeded expectations and looked like they were going to probably win the Western Conference this year had Jamal Murray not went down. So this series, I do believe, is probably going to go all of seven. But I think Denver, I, 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 I think Denver is going to win this series. I just, I, I, that's my belief. That's my opinion. I just think the Nuggets are not going to, to, to just believe all the hype that's out there. Granted, they know how good Portland is, but they they also know that their team uh, got a little bit better in the, in the off season. Uh, although you're not going to see Aaron Gordon and Jamal Murray out there as things were planned, but I still think the Denver Nuggets have uh, with Porter. I mean, they they have some great players, and I just think they they're going to find a way to bounce back. And I do believe it's going to go seven, but I think the Denver the Denver Nuggets will find a way to to get the win. And then you got the 2-7 matchup, which the Phoenix Suns, I, I think they are starting to realize why everyone had the Lakers as favorite. No matter, I mean, don't take anything away from the Phoenix Suns and what they've been able to accomplish this year. Monty Williams is a hell of a coach. Chris Paul is a hell of a leader. I just don't think this team, in that, as you were able to see, the Lakers should be up uh, in that series. Uh, but uh, don't be surprised that um, the Phoenix Suns are going to go down in this series. They just do not have it. When you get a healthy LeBron James, uh, Anthony Davis, and all, and everyone else, uh, Schroeder, um, Drummond, I mean, they are finding their groove. And, and that's the, the one, and this is why teams wanted to avoid the Lakers in that first round, is because of this. So that's what you got there. So anyway, that is your Western Conference. I, I think the Lakers will advance. I think we we will probably see that Laker Clippers matchup that we didn't get to see last year, and I also think we're going to see the Utah. I'm sorry, what you're going to see the Utah and Clippers matchup, and then you're going to probably see the Denver Lakers matchup there, and uh, and there's a possible chance. Uh, I think that Clippers Utah matchup will be interesting in the first round. So anyway, folks. That's going to wrap it up for this episode of the Mean Gene Show. Hope you enjoyed it. Want to thank my guest, Sam Smith. 
that best-selling author, Jordan Rules, for coming on the show and giving us his insights on on the book and uh, the Chicago Bulls. And I want to thank Jacob Meadows for coming on and providing us some great uh, insights there on the Eastern Conference playoff. Also, the sponsors, the Las Vegas Aces, Presidential Limousine by Captain, and the Westgate Las Vegas Resort Casino. All right, we'll be back here next week to do it all over again, folks. Enjoy your weekend. You've been listening to... The Mean Gene Show right here on KDWN, 720 AM, 101.5 FM.